Five thirty because it's got a OC delegation. So I'm going. You're going to have the first shot. First, tell me two questions. Do you think India will be a five trillion dollar economy by 2024-25? And what are the five things India should do to help us reach the target? Uh, so, Mohan, uh, first of all, I'm an optimist on this. We've, uh, in the last five years, grown at an average of about 7.5 percent. Uh, if you go back in time from 2004-5 onwards, we've lifted about. 300 million people above the poverty line. And uh, looking forward, if by 24, 25 financial year, you have to be a $5 trillion economy, you have to grow at an average of about 8.8% uh, plus about 83 to 8.4% uh, real GDP growth. Normal GDP has to be around 12%. I, to my mind, this is very, very doable, uh, considering the fact that the government, uh, firstly, has brought in a range of structural reforms. Uh, firstly, the goods and services tax. Secondly, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, which ended crony capitalism in India. Thirdly, RERA. And fourthly, I think, the direct benefit transfer. Now, the five things which need to be done is, firstly, I think the credit flow needs to be accelerated in a very big way. Uh, other countries across the world, when Korea was growing, when Japan was growing, when China was growing, private credit to GDP ratio was growing at very sharp rates. In India's case, it's still flat. So you need to really accelerate the pace of private credit to GDP ratio. And that is really the crux. And even if big time credit to large companies slows down, household credit to GDP must increase. And this means that flow of credit for household consumption, flow of credit to MSMEs, flow of credit for working capital really holds the key in the long run because of growth which job equity is critical. And for this to happen, a couple of radical decisions which government is pushing for. I think it's taken some very bold, very positive measures. First and foremost, it's pushed for asset monetization. Greenfield projects in India will take time and therefore brownfield project asset monetization is the key. The government is pushing for private sector investments in airport. It's getting airport authority to sell new its airports. Six of them were sold. Six more are on the block. Uh, it's putting out a lot of roads for uh, privatization, it's putting out ports for privatization, and it's putting out uh, transmission lines. So you'll have a vast number of brownfield projects in the market, and that'll bring in a large number of investors from India and abroad. Brownfield uh, projects are very de-risked. Uh, revenue streams are already flowing in, and therefore you'll get uh, investors coming in, and therefore they will, on their strength, they will bring in a lot of credit flow. That's number one. Number two is that the government has now accelerated the pace of pri public sector disinvestment. And, uh, you know, the announcements for uh, Bharat Petroleum, the announcement for Concor, these are big ticket announcement. This demonstrates the huge political will of the government to really push for public sector disinvestment. That's number two. Number three, to my mind, the key is about uh, bringing in a uh, huge amount of structural reforms which this government is pushing for. The Prime Minister has appointed uh, committees for uh, reforms in uh, both mining and in coal areas, pushing for commercial mining in coal, pushing for huge amount of acceleration of uh, uh, more resources from the mining sector, which to my mind can add more resources. And therefore, uh, these reports are, have already been completed. And so I personally feel that you'll see a lot of acceleration of uh, huge amount of structural policy reforms in these sectors, three. Fourthly, uh, I would say structural reform in agriculture sector, where 58% of India works, and where there's been very little of technology, there's been very little of major market reforms. So uh, the, the Prime Minister had appointed a committee headed by the Chief Minister, it was a, because agriculture is essentially a state subject, and therefore the Prime Minister had appointed a committee of Chief Ministers, and that report is also at its final stages and I can only tell you that some major reforms are needed in the agriculture sector which will accelerate the pace of pushing major reforms. Uh, I would also say that railways is one more sector where we can add one more percent to India's GDP if we accelerate the pace of, uh, you know, investments, private sector investments or uh, greater level of investments in uh, railway stations, etc. Uh, and therefore that's another key area. 
So five areas to my mind. Firstly, uh, greater flow of credit, uh, you know, accelerate private credit to GDP ratio. Secondly, push out asset monetization. Thirdly, push for greater level of uh, public sector disinvestment. Both these will make India a far more productively efficient economy in the long run. Fourthly, push for reforms in mining, coal, uh, agriculture. And fifthly, uh, go for big ticket reforms in railway sectors, which has remained unreformed for quite a long period. Uh, these, to my mind, really hold the key. But I would say that in the long run, if you want sustained growth over a long period of time, one of the key things that is being done is to really improve nutrition, education, health, because India can't grow on a sustained basis over a three-decade period without this. And the Prime Minister has put a lot of capital into this, his personal capital. We run a program called the Aspirational, uh, Aspirational District. District Program, where we monitor the performance of the... 115 most backward districts. We don't call them backward. We call them aspirational districts of India, where we monitor their program in 49 indicators on a real-time data basis, and we name and shame them. We put their performance out in public domain, and uh, it's a, it's a real-time dashboard. And we've seen some radical transformation taking place in some of the most backward districts of India. So this really, to my mind, is the key uh, for taking India to a five trillion dollar economy. Can I ask one more question? Now, how do you make these wonderful gentlemen tigers and give them that massive spirit that, uh, to make it happen? The, you know, the mood is down, everybody is down, the mood is down now. What can you do to make it happen? I want Jay to buy 1,000 aircrafts in five years, not some 100, 200 piddling aircrafts. I want him to uh, invest $10 billion in this country in the next two years. What will you do to get the tiger spirits back? So, uh, uh, one thing is that, uh, as I said, and I started off by saying this, that India can never grow at high rates, 9 to 10 percent, on a three-decade period uh, without uh, a very, very uh, dynamic role of the private sector. I really believe that all these countries which have grown for long periods have grown on the back of private sector. And therefore, that really holds the key. And this would really require us uh, to motivate, inspire, and in many ways bring in predictability and consistency, as well as, you know, there was crony capitalism in India. Uh, all that has been done away with IBC. So we should now say that from now onwards, everybody must fall in line with the new rules and regulation. Forget the past, whatever has happened. If we keep digging the past too much, too long back into the period, it's Correct. no good for the country. No good. The country needs to accelerate its pace Absolutely. of growth. Now that new rules have come in, this government has set the rules of the game right. Absolutely. It's made structural reforms in the economy. Absolutely. From now onwards, don't do this. If yes. you do this, you lose your businesses Absolutely. through IBC. And therefore, look at the future, look at the, the progress forward and create thousands of new entrepreneurs in India, uh, which is what the aim of the prime, prime Minister has been through the Startup India movement and through Atal Innovation Mission and many other things. Now, will you ask our Prime Minister to meet us, talk to us, and allow us the spirits to come up because we want to meet him. We want an interaction between the Prime Minister and industry every month and three months till our mood comes up and we feel very, we're all positive, we believe in the idea of India, we believe in five trillion dollars, but our mood is very down. We have been shocked out of existence by all the changes that you've done in a short period of time. We want to meet our Prime Minister and we want to communicate with him, tell him our concern, cry over his shoulder and ask him to do something for us and keep our moods up. Will you do that uh, before you go? No, uh, Mr. Pai, first and foremost, the mood is created by people like you and me, yes. you know, and therefore, uh, I'm, my mood is perfect. Your my mood, mood is perfect. Yeah, yeah, so therefore, I think to, uh, to kind of create this low morale uh, coming from someone like you does no good to the country. It does I no mean, good. You are, a, you are a man of great morale and Absolutely. great determination. So we should always talk positive. Absolutely. I mean, we should always be full of optimism. Agreed. Never, never be pessimist about Agreed. India. The days of India have just begun. That's number Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Number two, the Prime Minister always constantly, you know, I've done this Champions of Change where I invited all the young people, young entrepreneurs who've yes. done some outstanding work. Prime Minister spent four days with them. He constantly interacted with them, he constantly, uh, you know, motivated them, got a lot of ideas for them and really pushed it. So Prime Minister is always open to meeting uh, okay. young, young and dynamic and bold and courageous entrepreneurs. Wonderful. You have to go. Thank you very much. And I think our mood is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Folks, give him a round of applause. He's the India bull, the big India bull. And we know we depend on him to set the narrative right. Now Jay and Nikhil, we've got to come down to ground reality. But first, let me give you folks some little bit of data. 
After 1950, when we got our constitution, our first prime minister decided India has to be a socialistic paradise. So brought in socialism in a very big way and state control. It is maybe good, we'll not debate that, except he suppressed private capital in this country by getting in the quota license Raj. So from 1950 to 1980, India grew at 3.5% a year, population grew at 2.5% a year, the world grew 1% more a year during those 30 years. So we fell behind, we became poorer on a comparative basis in 1980 compared to 1950, because in 1950, in this part of the world, in Asia, China was devastated by the 100-year civil war, Mao came to power in 49, Japan was devastated, Southeast Asia was devastated, we're the only country standing, and in 47, the British left, we had 1.5 billion pounds selling to our credit, with the debased the currency, and you know, we did nothing. 1950, we opened up, Indira Gandhi opened up, Rajiv Gandhi came as a breath of fresh air, we were that generation, we saw him as a great hope. Yes, he opened up, we grew at 5.5% 1980 to 1990, and population grew at 2.25%, income levels went up, debt went up from $20 billion to $80 billion during the decade. Now from 1991 when we broke, because the debt was too much, with our GDP in 91 before we opened up was $275 billion. 2019, March, our GDP has gone for to $2.73 trillion. We have grown at 8.6% a year, every single year, in dollar terms, for 28 years. This is an extraordinary achievement. So grow from here in six years to $5 trillion at around 8% plus 4% inflation, 12% nominal, with the rupee going up from 71 to 75. That's the mass Sanjeev Sanyal gives, which is very realizable. We could do it. So it is doable, India will reach $5 trillion, if not in 25, maybe 26, but we're going to get there. And I think everybody should work towards that. And the best part is the Prime Minister is giving us an aspirational target. We need high aspiration in India. I want him to buy a thousand aircraft. I want to invest $10 billion in two years. You may go rob a bank or rob Massa or get somebody, but that's different. But we want to do that and we can do it and we can build our country. So on that, I think having aspiration is there. And since you are in Bombay, you are from Bombay. Oh, you're in Delhi, I pity you. You've got the Lutyens media giving you all these negative things. I'm from Bangalore, far away from Delhi, so the hawa doesn't come here, come down south. So we are very positive, we are very gungo. Now, let me ask you with this context. You know, let me start with Jay. Jay, do you think we can reach $5 trillion? <coughs> what is we'll, your personal I, view? I think we'll exceed it. Uh, I fully agree with uh, my fellow panelists in every point he made. Uh, I think we're on a fantastic growth trajectory. I'm extremely positive, upbeat, and I think the ease of doing business has been, never been better. However, I, you know, since I have this opportunity, I don't think it's about economical growth that we should just focus on. I think we'll exceed in terms of the targets, uh, and I don't think there's any issue in terms of in that. But I think we should talk about sustainable growth, and sustainable growth comes from social development. I can't subscribe to how our poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. We have 600 million people in terms of, okay, who do not have, uh, you know, more than a dollar and a half uh, on a daily basis. We have 200 million people who don't have food, of which 70 million are kids. I mean, how do we keep talking about growing the economy when we leave people behind? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I'd like to remember in terms of um, uh, one of the greatest visionaries of India. Uh, his name is Nanaji Deshmukh and he said that the gold essentially is in the villages and unless we in terms of pick up India from the bottom which is our villages and make them productive make them in terms of more in terms of you know transparently uh, economically uh, able and self-reliant India doesn't stand a chance we keep focusing on uh, urban areas whether you want to call it Luthians you want to call it whatever you want I think we should focus more in our villages we have 600,000 villages which need developing Nanaji Deshmukh has had a complete model created of how you can take people from below the poverty line to above the poverty line he's done it in six months I think our Prime Minister has done an incredible job in focusing on the rural development because I think I've had enough of people trying to only develop the urban areas and economical development. I think our focus should be on social development and doing something for the 600 million people who do not have any visibility on any growth. Well, uh, before you answer, let me give some data. I think we should go with data. 
Latest data says 43% of India's population depends on the agriculture sector, which is growing at 3%. Agriculture sector is 15% of GDP. They can't remain on the land, they have to get off the land. 57% of India's population depends on industry and services, which is growing at 7 to 8%, giving us the 7%, 8% growth. The per capita income of people in agriculture is 42,000 rupees a year, of industry is 1,25,000 rupees a year, and of service of 1,67,000 rupees a year. This utopian dream of villages coming up is not going to happen and it cannot happen. Nowhere have people stayed in villages and built an economy in the world. Nanaji Deshmukh did it a long time ago in a small set. We can't do it anymore. China moved 350 million people from the land to, from the, land to the factory and, the, and the, the urban areas and they prospered. Prosperity only comes by urbanization, not in Delhi and Mumbai, but in the 5,000 small towns. So we've got to get our you know, actions right because there's no hope in the villages. If you produce more food, the price falls. We produce 283 million tons of grain, 60 million tons is in stock, and you produce more onion, the price falls. And the price falls, the farmer gets devastated. By producing more, you, unless you export more, you're going to destroy their livelihood. So we have a serious challenge there. We've got to move people off the land. I think that is very clear. Now, Nikhil, what is your I view? I completely disagree in terms of that there is no hope, by the way. I'm a complete optimist, and I have been no, no, in the villages myself. You can be an myself. optimist, that's fine, but you've got to be a realist about Sometimes what is happening on the ground. Sometimes you need to go and see in terms of what's actually happening in the villages and the development that's happening in the villages to comment or pontificate on Nikhil, uh, hope. Nikhil, I run the la world's largest midday meal program for children, 15,000 schools all over this country. We feed 1.8 billion children. We feed them in smaller towns. We know the reality. 70% of farmers don't want the children to do farming. They want to go to the cities, be like you go to Mumbai and see the film industry and live happily not live in a small village where nothing is going to happen for a long time anyway Nikhil now tell me what do you think is going to happen do you believe in this and what are the things that we need to do so first of all uh, uh, you know I'm very bullish uh, on the aspiration of getting to uh, five trillion plus economy uh, just setting the context right if you look at 2014 we were about a 1.7 trillion today we are about 2.7 trillion and the aspiration is to double that right uh, as you stated 8% real GDP I think there are five imperatives which will get us there you know first is the investment rate uh, I think today we are about at 29 percent I think we need to get into the mid 30s because if you look at all economies who have grown at eight uh, percent it has been an investment driven economy yeah. um, second is uh, uh, consumer uh, savings rate uh, again we are about 29 30 percent I think that needs to go to about a 40 percent rate uh, third and a very important part is uh, for us to become an export driven economy uh, almost one trillion uh, of that five trillion likely can come from export I know their productivity and there's uh, you know other things we need to go in to get that uh, and the fourth and the fifth are very interrelated which is really what we do as GoDaddy uh, you know the digitization and a small business and the jobs right uh, I just want to share the stats right there are about seven billion people around the world about three and a half billion are employed uh, out of which Fortune 500 or even Fortune 1000 companies employ less than, less than 50 million people. So where are the rest of the 2.8 billion people working? Either they're entrepreneurs, small business, or doing something you know, in, in a much smaller space. So our ability to be able to create you know, and stimulate that ecosystem is gonna go a long way, especially around the women, right? If you get to the global 48% women employ, you know, employability, that alone is close to $700 billion of input into the economy. But Nikhil, where are the jobs going to come? Jobs will come with investment. Investment has to come with money. We don't have enough financial resources. Financial savings are only 11% of GDP. From now till 2025 to go to 5 trillion, we have to invest 30% of GDP. 30% of GDP per year is around 3.75 trillion dollars. Now, unless we open up to foreign capital, go to Japan, borrow $500 billion in the next five years, as Prime Minister Modi did for that, uh, you know, uh, bullet train project at, at a 0. 5% interest payable after 30, uh, 30 years or 50 years, when some of us may not be around. So how, do you, how, how can you achieve that unless you open up and do something dramatic? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all about cost of capital, right? Today, I think the cost of capital in our country is fairly high. And this is a great example yeah. as to, you know, getting that yeah. in at a very, very favorable rate, right? Uh, secondly, I think, um, you know, we have done a wonderful job getting into ease of doing business, you know, moved 79 point, uh, by 79 uh, uh, ranks. Uh, one thing I think which we can really move the needle is uh, uh, enforcement of contracts. Today, uh, we rank 163rd but out of... the courts of don't work. Sorry? The courts don't work. Yeah, what do so you there, do? there are 35 million cases out yes, there. Yes, what do we do? Result. Appoint 
triple the number of judges in one year? Yeah, I think, I think those are the structural reforms, you know, what you're mentioning and uh, Mr. Kant was mentioning that. I think some of them are already in place, but that alone itself will improve the productivity and efficiency. But uh, I think uh, there's no better expert in education than you in terms of job being created, right? I mean, today our gross enrollment rate is 25%. If you look back yeah, five, six yeah. years back, it was 12%. So I think the further that moves, the more entrepreneurs, more small businesses will create. And I think that could be a break, uh, you know, great source of uh, employability. Okay, Jay, now here's a question for you. In the last five years, we've seen unbelievable change. We had demonetization, which made people kosher, aware of what they need to do. We had the GST, which brought in reforms. And then we had the IBC, where the cronies were going to jail. They lose their companies, the banks hopefully get the money back. And then we had the RERA, where real estate has been reformed. And then we had the you know, NPA crisis, where we had 15 lakh crores in NPAs. Now we've got to get it back. And then you got the ILFS liquidity crisis. We've gone through such tremendous change over the last five years. What is the healing touch that industry wants today so that we don't have to face the change? Because most uh, industries say, we just cannot cope with this rapid change with such a short period of time, we just give up. So what are the healing touch you would want uh, as the po policy makers uh, to make sure that people become positive? I mean, they're positive, but we've got to be more positive and start investing again. Well, I'm for rapid change and I have no uh, negative comments on in terms of, you know, anyone saying that, oh, it's too rapid. Uh, we need rapid change. If you want to, in terms of, you know, get to where you want to get to, you need rapid change. And we have seen rapid change in five years and I think we have a lot more to come. What about you? What do you say? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, is I there a need for a healing touch? And I'll explain once more. Out of the ILFS, the GDP has come down this quarter, that is July to September. SBI, Somia Go says it's going to be 4.2%, somebody says 4.7%. And this quarter, October, November, December, we're seeing some green shoots, not much. So this is a write-off. And in the next quarter, we don't see growth coming up to 6% again. This whole year will be a write-off and it puts pressure on the balance five years. So what are the healing touch you want to bring back the animal spirit? Spirits. I mean, he's a bull, I'm a bull, he's a bull, he's a bull. But you know, there are bears in, left in Mumbai and Delhi who will not come here, he'll not, I mean, Anna will not invite them here, you know. So what, what are the healing touch you think we should do? So, um, I'll, I'll answer that, but I want to give a healing ask, comment. Ask the Prime Minister, <laughs> even Anna will make sure that he gets to hear, but ask the Prime Minister, what are the things that you want to change so that people feel happy and go invest? Yeah, so talking about happiness, right, so GoDaddy uh, does this annual survey. Uh, for small business entrepreneurs and ranks them against global counterparts. Uh, one out of two, every small business owner today believes that they're going to grow over 50% in the next to three to five years, which is 1.7 times more than the global counterparts. So I think in the long run, I think everybody is very bullish and very kind of optimistic. I think the short term, uh, I think it's really the fundamental right, access to capital. Uh, either it's you know giving uh, rebates around taxation. I think taxation, it's still the, the government did, did a great job recently uh, on reducing the tax rate for the corporations, but you know at an MSME level, I think there is room there. Uh, and also uh, you know looking at basically uh, you know kind of helping reform some of the uh, some of the policies, right? Because the 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 time it takes, right, for MSMEs to get credit back from the government, a lot of time the programs have been in, put in place, but I think the like, for example, GST credits, right? I think it's just taking longer cycles, and I think that would move the needle transactionally. Uh, Jay, what is your view? What are the five things you would want from a prime minister? I'm saying prime minister as a proxy for the government of India, because there are things like this which are impediments to fast growth. What are the five things you would want to see in the next two months? Well, infrastructure is one for sure. It's not uh, going to happen tomorrow. No, it we takes know time. But, you know, today we, we sort of waste about 25% of everything we grow and transport. Yes. Uh, you know, and then correspondingly, you have 200 million people who don't have food and 61 million are kids. So, I mean, it's a, it's a contradiction. So, have, infrastructure, have hopefully, will, will, will have investment and it'll be faster and it'll be rapid. Okay. Apart from that, I think in terms of, you know, the basic fundamentals coming back to bottom up from the villages is what I would focus on. So forget the five. I'm in terms of four, bottom up development, That's going to social time, development, Jay. infrastructure development is from the top, but if we cannot empower the people who live in our villages to stay in our villages and not come to the cities, I think we have a fundamental problem and a disconnect here. Jay, you ask a villager where he wants to go, he wants to come and sit in your house, not in his house. I'm I mean, sorry, they have high aspirations. When they come to, no, no, no. When they come from the village, they have no savings, they have no social welfare, they have no security. Your servant or your driver in terms of what, what, do, they, what do they gain by coming to the city? They are living in a deficit. 
you pay them less than what they spend in a year. If you in terms of get upset with them, you fire them. They have no time to spend with their family, developing family welfare, because they're slaving for you throughout the day and night. So where is the gold? It's, the wealth is not in the city. So the stay. wealth is in the villages. And if you empower stay. the people in the villages, they won't come to the city. Okay, That's Jay, the point. We, I, think, I think we'll leave it at that. I like this romanticism. What's your last word from you? So I, I think if you were uh, uh, asking one thing, right, I think, uh, again, uh, if we're doing a lot of resets in the economy, we've done GST, we've done demodernization, why can't we do the reset of these contract resolutions? Because any, you talked about FDI, right? Any big company, when they think about investment, that is the biggest fear. I'm going to be stuck in the court system for something Absolutely. which is going to go wrong, right? So if that can be reset, like the, we have done the reset in, on demonetization, I think that could really move uh, the needle very fast. Okay, folks, we have to end here. Give a, yes, 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 Arnab. You want to ask questions? No, no, I don't want to ask. I don't want to ask. I, I just can't help but comment, and I must say this about Jay and Nikhil, that, you know, we speak about a despondent mood, right? Uh, bankers are despondent. These, this is the next generation of Indian business, and I think they're so optimistic, so we should give them a... They're the ones who run businesses. So I, I full hats off to both of them. Big round of applause to Jay and Nikhil. They'll get the annual spirits back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anup, and thank you, folks. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Nikhil. Thank you very much, Mr. Pal.